Hello, how are you doing? And a very warm welcome back to youtube.com forward slash Wi Fi Sheep with me, Tom. Now, cast your mind back to a couple of months ago, around November, December time, 2023, and I reviewed the UE2 X1. In fact, I have the box right here. Now, if you remember, the X1 from UE2 was an Intel x86 64 bit based single board computer, and it was absolutely fantastic it was so fantastic in fact that it's actually the machine in use right now recording this very video that you are watching well roll on to january 2024 and i got home one evening to find a parcel sitting for me on the porch and it was this a complete surprise that ue2 have sent me their latest product the r1 the counterpart to the X1. Now the R1 is an ARM based rock chip single board computer with very similar specs to the X1 with all the advantages you have from a RISC ARM based processor. The specifications are extremely impressive. Let's take a look. So here I am on wiki.ue2.com and I'll put the link to this in the description to this video. And here is the description for the R1. As you can see, it's all beautifully laid out with all the compatibility ports and features. As we found out before, UE2 products are feature rich and really, really good value for money. So I am really excited to try out the R1. If I just show you the specifications. So the thing that interested me the most here is the CPU. It's the Rockchip RK3588S. It's an eight core 64 bit CPU. It has four Cortex A76 and four Cortex A55 running up to 2.4 gigahertz. It also will automatically throttle back and forth so it doesn't need manually overclocking. As with UE2 products, they come in a number of specifications that you can add or take away depending on what you want so you're not paying for things you don't need. RAM comes in four, eight, 16 and 32 gig options. It also has the MPU, which is the AI Accelerator MPU. This is new for this kind of single board computer and something I've not seen before. So that's going to be very interesting. Storage, optional. It has eMMC with up to 32, 64, 128 and 126 gigabytes are available, as well as ability for SATA onboard storage. Networking is Ethernet is onboard. Wireless cards can be added. And you can have Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6, including Bluetooth included on the modules. These modules are sold separately and available through the UE2 shop. Videos, it can output an impressive 8K resolution with 4K and the more standard 1080p that we'd probably end up using here at Wi-Fi Sheep. It's 8K compatible video encoding. Display options, we have HDMI out. We also have the ability for USB-C video out and we can add via the ribbon cables, we can add third party ribbon based monitors, which we've looked at before, including UET's own LCD based display. USB capabilities, we have USB A and C on board. We also have onboard audio capabilities, something that has gone missing from rival products of recent time, including traditional audio jacks, as well as pin header. We also have input devices. So this has an onboard microphone and the ability to plug a mic socket in via a two pin header. And just down the bottom here, you can see the operating systems it supports, including Android, Debian, Ubuntu, and there's also a Core Linux root build. So really, really impressive stuff. And I have to say personally, I am blown away by the quality and performance of these Rockchip ARM processors. They are literally some of the best, if not the best you can actually buy on the market at the moment. I've had other devices that use Rockchip CPUs and I've always been really, really impressed. So I'm generally excited to try out the R1. Okay, so let's take a look at the UE2 R1. Just to compare it to the previous, the X1 product, just so you can see the size, the boxes are technically the same size packet, but obviously this one is uh, orientated this way around. Uh, both were, you know, beautifully packed, professionally packed, and, you know, a genuine, really top-end, high-quality product, which is always a good sign when doing these kind of reviews. Let's just take a quick look at the box then. So this is the UE2 R1 single board computer and it gives you some base specs on the back so we again i've just gone through these on the website 
and I do have because they sent me separately I do have the optional Wi-Fi Bluetooth card. This is the same card that we used previously on the X1 and will fit that. But this is a separate thing that you would buy separately. Now, I'm just gonna see if I can figure out what the spec of mine is. So here it is. The spec here, this is an eight gig model with 64 gig of onboard eMMC flash storage. So let's take a look, see what you think. The box itself is plain. That's okay. Ah, right, okay. So inside, we have here some optional heat sink. I think it's a heat sink and I think there's some uh, pads or adhesive pads for sticking the heat sink onto the board. We have the board itself in an anti-static bag. I don't think there's anything in my preview package the PSU would fit in here now the reason there isn't a PSU in what they've sent me is that at the moment they don't appear to do a British plug power supply so if you're a European or American that's no problem the PSU is they do a European or an American plug they don't do the British free plug standard which is probably why it hasn't been included in this sample kit that's been sent to me but that AC to DC power adapter up to 12 volts and that should be fine. So let's take the box out of the way and let's have a look at the board itself then. Okay. And it's a relatively compact, but very feature rich single board computer device. It's a little bit bigger than a Raspberry Pi. Just to hand, I've got an original Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi hasn't really changed much in size, even in the last sort of decade. So as you can see, it's a little bit bigger, but not by much. And there's certainly a lot more power and a lot more features on this particular product, even against, let's say, a new Raspberry Pi 5. So what have we got? Well. You can see here the most obvious we have is we've got Ethernet, we've got two USB 2, one USB 3 and a USB C connector. We've got full size HDMI, we've got um, status lights for power and I'm guessing process or load. And we have a barrel connector, which is how we power it up. And it should be 9 volt or 12 volt compatible. I think it's 12 volt compatible. Uh, we can just check that if we head over back to the website. Uh, power there we are you can see there dc 12 volt compatible ideally three amps now as i said i don't have a power supply supplied by them for this because they don't do one for the british market at the moment if you're like me and in the uk and thinking well how do we power it it's actually not a big problem because you can use an off-the-shelf power brick like this which is absolutely fine so this is outputting a 12 volts and four amps so that will be more than sufficient and just need the barrel connector. There we go, which should be fine. And it is, connects in fine. And that will give me more than enough power, more than enough amps, and that gives me the correct British free pin plug on the other end, so I can power off the mains no problem. Just to bring to your attention a couple of details, so here is the Rockchip processor itself, and we've got two banks of RAM, so I believe these will both be four gigabytes each this is the emmc onboard storage and you can even see on the silk screen of that just it's a sandisk unit and it's 64 gigabytes i can just read it on the silk screen we also have things like gpio that we've been used to not entirely sure if that's mapped exactly the same as it would on a pi but we have gpio we've also got tf or sd card for micro sd so you can boot straight from an sd card and here we have the uh, audio jacks and we have the various pinouts for the microphone audio we talked about. We also have a series of buttons on the side, including reboot, reset, flash. Uh, and these are option commands. And just to show you on the underside, we also have a series of ribbon connectors for connecting to SATA devices and also for external displays. Now, I think the first thing we'll do is let's see if there's anything preloaded on this, if it comes with an EMMC, which this one does. So I've got my HDMI lead here. 
We'll plug that in. Okay, all looking good. So let's power up. Lights come on, good sign. And let's see what we've got from Capture. Now the first boot can always be sometimes the slowest. Oh, I see a cursor. Ah, there we go. And we're up and we're running. Which means there is an operating system on board which looks like XFCE. And it's probably Debian. So it's probably Debian XFCE on board as standard. And there is the UE2 desktop and boot screen. So, first thing I think I need to do, at the very least, is let's just plug a mouse in. So I've just got one of these little cheap USB mice that I always use on the channel. Okay. Um, right. The first thing I do notice, and this may be purely because mine is a early production run sample unit, is... Everything is in Chinese, either simplified or Mandarin. I'm not entirely sure. I'm not an expert on Chinese languages. Um, so obviously if we click, yeah, everything is in Chinese, more or less. Um, a very equipped operating system, but I think we do need to... We've got Chromium Browser on board. Um, but we may need to make some adjustments. So I'll just tell us what we're running. So it's uh, bullseye. So it's a uh, Debian 11 on this as stock. Uh, there is our graphics resolution. And audio output. Uh, display settings are there. So I think the first thing to do for me, just so we can carry on, is to just find where the language settings are and uh, set this back to English so that we can actually see or understand at the very least what it is we're actually doing. Okay, so welcome back. It's a week later and uh, we're back looking at the UE2 R1. Now, just to show you what I have on Capture, here is the stock system as included on the EMMC, still in the Chinese language format. I did check with some colleagues at my place of work and I can tell you that this is actually simplified Chinese. Um, now I did put on, I'll just show you the web here. This is the forums from UE2. And I did put up a question asking for if the stock installation did have an easy way of switching the languages. And um, yeah, not, particularly helpful but the um, marketing representative who I work with uh, who sent me the sample board in the first place did actually uh, suggest something which we're going to try now which hopefully will resolve this issue again I stress I have a feeling this because this is a sample uh, board sent to me I honestly think that the uh, production versions that you'll see for the Western market should be set to English anyway if, for whatever reason, you end up in this scenario, let's see if this works. So if we open up Terminal. Oh, by the way, I've also, you may notice, reduced the resolution. So we're running at 720p just so you can see a little bit easier. And I can see a little bit easier what is on screen. So that's why uh, I've reduced the resolution. So it's been suggested that if we try, and let's see if this works, dpkg-reconfigure. space and then locals I wonder if we have to sue I wonder if we have to go in a pseudo for that ah yes there we go okay so, mm. so let's just have a look by scrolling down the list ENGB that one might work for us so we'll select that okay now if we select ENGB And you can see it's now, hopefully, this is generation complete. Okay, and we've just done a restart. And there we go. That set the language up. So there we are. Excellent. Right. I know what I'm doing now, <laughs> which is good. So, okay. With that little issue out the way, as I said, hopefully the versions that are going to be sold 
will be localized, but if they're not, then the way to do it is simply sudo dpk dash reconfigure locals. There are the locals, and then you simply select what you want. So let's go and find those English ones again. There's some English. And you press spacebar to select. Then you hit return or enter on your keyboard. Then you can select uh, to set language and it resets. But you do need to restart the system. So brilliant. OK, that's working. Right, so now I just want to shut this down. So we'll go shut down and shut down. And I want to talk about connectivity with the device. So we just shut down there. So let's just power that down quick. OK, powered off. Right. So Wi-Fi and Bluetooth is not standard on the R1. It's the same in the X1. It's the same in the R1. However, UE2 do offer a plug-in Wi-Fi Bluetooth module. We've seen these before. We used them with the X1. It's exactly the same module. And you can buy these separately. They're not very expensive. But basically what you get is this little card, which is superb. You get a screw. And we've got the two antennas that are needed. Uh, there's no aerial, if you like, fitting into the card. So it does need these plugs. So no problem there at all. These little pads, these have a decent pad you can sort of stick on a wall or stick inside a case. Whatever you want to do, really. What I want to do right now is just see if I can get these just to plug into the little holes there. Last time I needed help of just a flatbed screwdriver just to help apply a little bit of pressure just to get them to clip in. They will go, but it just needs a little bit of skill just to get it to fit. Okay, they're on, so it's a bit fiddly and you just have to use that flat blade of a screwdriver just to help put pressure on the points, but they're now in, so that's great. So this card sits on top of the R1 into this slot here. And you can see how it's, uh, if you like, uh, cut or grooved, so it can only go in one way. And the card goes in like so, and bends down. And then there is a screw, which is provided, which goes into the hole just here. So let me just grab a crosshead screwdriver. Okay, and that additional card should now give us Bluetooth and Wi-Fi connectivity. So the next thing to do naturally is to power back up and let's connect to the internet. One thing I will just mention, because this will catch people out, is there's no boot screen or boot kernel on the R1. So it literally just loads straight to desktop and goes, thank you very much. And you go, oh, OK. So you'll see this in a moment. There we go. You see, it just goes straight through. It's very, very fast to boot, but there's no, no kernel or anything. So it's just literally the first thing you will see. And let's go and configure ourselves some internet. So, luckily for us, it has actually found the Wi-Fi network. So it's found the Realtek Wi-Fi, so we're on there. And my network is somewhere on here. I'm probably down, right down on more networks. I am. I'm all the way down here. So let me just go and grab my key so we can actually log in. OK, and with a bit of luck, we should be able to connect. There we are, straight in, no problem. Right, we're connected, he says. OK, so let's check out web browser. And it is a version of Google Chromium, comes up really, really quick. And you know what we're going to do? You know where we're going? We're going to go straight over to youtube.com forward slash Wi-Fi sheep and uh, yeah the video playback is fine I'm not getting any sound let's just have a quick look at sound shall we audio mixer for devices port so at the moment it's it's mapped to let's have a look yeah it's it's mapped purely to the speaker and headphone ports on the actual device itself but uh, yeah. Okay, so that's something just to bear in mind. Probably is easy to, to set up so it can go out via HDMI. Uh, Video-wise, 
It's actually fine, isn't it? So let's go up to 720p, which is the maximum quality. And just see how well that does. Yeah, it's all right, isn't it? It looks fine. Playback's fine, that's 720p, which for us is fine. So a lot of the time I'm asked, why don't I just do benchmark settings? Why do I do this instead? Because benchmark settings, which every other YouTube reviewer does, don't mean anything to the general public unless you know what the results are coming back as. Doing practical things like this, like looking at YouTube videos, for example, is a very good way of gauging how well, how fast the system is if we actually do the sort of physical things you're likely to do on this kind of board. So that's kind of why I do what I do. Uh, let's have a look at Office. No LibreOffice on this, which is interesting. So what have we got? We've got settings. Uh, we have got a few settings. By the way, when I changed the display settings, I did it in here originally. So you, we've got the full 1080p. I'll just drop down to 720, and you can actually set your fresh rate, etc. So, um, and you can also do rotation. So it's your standard XFCE stuff. So that's great. Um, I wonder if we've got any piles doing this. Let's see if we've got a Python on board. We actually spell Python right. Mm, nope, doesn't look like it. Python 3. Oh, we've got a Python 3. Okay, so no Python 2, but Python 3 is on board. Okay, that's good. So we do have Python on board as standard or a version. Um, yeah, I mean, you could install OpenOffice. It wouldn't be, you know, the end of the world to do such a thing. Um, if I can just go, let's see, sudo uh, app, oh, apt get, uh, or just say I meant Libra. I don't even think I spelled that right. Hang on. Okay, we seem to be done. So normally you should do a restart. But let's just see. There we are under Office. So let's open up Libra off it. Yeah, it's fast. <laughs> wow, that's fast. Write a document. Yeah, as expected. Very, very usable. LibreOffice, because it's Java based, can be slow. If you're running a slow ARM board, then you really do feel it with LibreOffice. If LibreOffice just flies through like it has just done here, then uh, yeah, no problems at all with that. Absolutely fantastic. So um, let's just see. There's no lag either. Oh, I can't spell. <laughs> Hello, world. Yeah. Absolutely superb, no problem with that at all. Brilliant. So yeah, that's actually worked fine once we got the language switched over, which again I stress hopefully won't be a problem on Western selling production boards. But one thing I just want to see is just how warm we're getting. Well, that's not bad. Obviously, we do have that little heat sink that we were given, uh, which we could fit to the board, and I probably will fit to mine. Uh, as I do some more experimenting with this. But yeah, and that's not bad because then we're running just with passive cooling with no heatsink. Actually, that's running quite well, to be honest with you. So it depends what you're using the board for, but you may not actually even need the heatsink. Uh, just passive air cooling might be enough. If you imagine mounting this into a box or a device and you've got all the main sockets on one side, including power, so it's quite nice to be able to mount it like that. And you can bring audio out to the side if you wanted. But if you also want to, let's say, build a device like I might want to with an internal USB keyboard, you've actually got a socket, which I think is that one there. Don't quote me on that, but I believe it's this one here to actually break out USB internally, which could be extremely useful. Uh, so this thing has all kinds of flexibilities and possibilities. So the R1 from UE2, a really interesting product and i look forward to playing around with this a little bit more i have seen an unofficial build of windows 11 compatible with the rock chip cpu used in this particular board so i think for me that is definitely something i want to explore with this product if you are looking for something a little bit more serious and definitely more powerful than a Raspberry pi 5 then the r1 might be just what you're looking for 
Details for the product, including links of where to buy, are in the description to this video. A huge thank you to UE2 for sending me this sample product version of the R1. And of course, a huge thank you to you for watching. If you haven't done so already, please do consider liking and subscribing. And I hope to see you real soon right here on the channel. Until next time, bye for now.